Hello, uh, Jim Howard here in Fort Worth, Texas. Today's date, it is Sunday, August 20th of 2017. This is just going to be a general blog instead of being typed the way I've been doing since 1982. Actually, long before that, uh, I put out a printed publication for years. And I did a radio program that was, you know, broadcast around the world on shortwave radio. So, but this is, this is going to be a video blog. And I'm going to ramble, I'm sure, and probably I might even get sidetracked and not even uh, end up talking about what I've been doing recently, though, since I don't have any notes is uh, opening windows you know on the browser and then I can click on it and uh, remember maybe what I wanted to talk about uh, so start off with a few real short comments that I would like to make and let you know too what my opinion is some of you may care I may some of you may agree with me and maybe a bunch of you disagree with me um, when I was in grade school I read uh, Ulysses Grant's autobiography very thick book he had throat cancer and he worked really hard to get that book out so that he would have some because he was poor this is you know General Ulysses S. Grant and later president of the United States and he didn't have any money and he finished the book and uh, then died. I read that when I was in grade school and I think the part of the book that stuck out the most to me was when it came to Appomattox and the surrender of Robert E. Lee to Grant and I thought that was really uh, great. I mean, everything about it was just, uh, you know, Grant is in a uniform that's dirty, that uh, I don't think it was even an officer's uniform, and he shows up, well, Grant showed up first. Grant is in a beautiful uniform, and uh, Everything is spotless and clean and just perfect. And so uh, Lee was there first, and Grant shows up. They talk. Uh, General Lee didn't remember Grant. Grant had actually served under him in, uh, was it the invasion of Mexico? I forget. Uh, which, but uh, so anyway, uh, Grant, you know, dictates Lee is surrendering. Grant dictates the the terms of the surrender, and Grant allows the officers to keep their. Uh, swords don't have to surrender their swords. I think they could keep their sidearm. Uh, they rank and file troops if they own a horse, if it's their horse or mule. Uh, they can keep it so that they could go back to their state and farm the land or do whatever was necessary. Uh, Grant was really, and I thought at the time, I thought that was just wonderful. You know, he didn't make Lee surrender his sword uh, to him. He let General Lee keep his sword. Then when Lee was leaving, some of the Union troops started, you know, and Grant had them know, you know, these are no cheering, no uh, anything that might humiliate them. You know, they are our they always were our countrymen and they still are our countrymen. So that really impressed me as a 
kid in grade school, uh, I spent, um, my father worked, when I was in grade school, my father worked at uh, Savannah River Project, I'm not sure it's exactly, the H-bomb plant, they were building the H-bomb plant. And uh, so my mother and I went out there to uh, spend the summer when I was, you know, school was over, so I went out there for three months. We lived in a government trailer in Barnwell, South Carolina, and uh, that's before desegregation. There was, you know, colored restrooms and white restrooms. There was two water fountains, colored water fountain and a white water fountain. I saw a chain gang. Uh, chain gangs. Uh, I was asked, the kids that I played with there, uh, I was asked what what state I came from and Missouri attempted to join the, uh, from Missouri, Missouri attempted to join the Confederacy and I forget the exact details now. I think the governor was attempted to uh, take the state of Missouri into the Confederacy and the Union Army, well not the the Army, the United States Army, the legitimate, uh, was there and prevented it from happening. Uh, or else the governor didn't want, and the legislature, I can't remember the exact details now, but the Confederacy, the South listed, had a star there for Missouri but Missouri was pretty much occupied, although battles were fought in, you know, in Missouri and in the greater Kansas City area where I lived. I wasn't alive then. I'm uh, 76 years old. I'm not that old. But uh, about, well, I've changed my mind. I always thought that the you know the Grant and the and the Abraham Lincoln say you know before he was assassinated by terrorists from the uh, South at the end of the war when the war had already uh, been won and when Abraham Lincoln you know said when the war was won and then Lincoln was at the White House and. Uh, people gathered because they were glad the war was over. We lost we lost more people in the Civil War than we've lost in any other war that we've been in: World War One, World War Two, Korea, uh, Vietnam. We lost, and I think I'm not sure on this. You might check me. I think if you added together all of those conflicts and the people we lost, I think I think the Civil War we lost more than if you added all those up together. It was traumatic. Anyway, Abraham Lincoln, you know, told the crowd, you know, that uh, I forget it was, you know, beautiful words or whatever about, you know, binding up the wounds of the country and not being vindictive towards the South. And then he asked that uh, Dixie be played. And then he was assassinated a few days, the next day or a few days later uh, by terrorists from the South. So, um, now, because of everything that has transpired, I think, I hate to say it, I think a mistake was, I think a mistake was made. I think, you know, I think uh, Robert E. Lee should have been hung as a traitor. Uh, Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, should have been hung. I just think we made it because all the, that's all that time ago, and this we have this still. Uh, we've come to this situation that we're in now of tremendous numbers of people saying the South will rise again, and and uh, I think we handled it wrong. But about the statues, definitely, I think the statues should come down if they are outside of you know, a courthouse outside of the uh, state capitol building. Uh, but we've seen on the news uh, uh, 
uh, some people in some town, I forget where, they pulled a, stat pulled a statue down. No, we should, this should all should be lawfully done. Uh, vandalism, uh, destruction of property, that shouldn't happen. But the monuments that are outside, you know, Americans, black or white or whatever, should not have to walk by or come out of court or go into court and have uh, a statue to Jefferson Davis or Robert E. Lee or, or anyone else who were traitors to the United States that attacked the United States. Uh, that, that's a, a change in my opinion because of everything that has happened over all these years and can, not only continues to happen, but appears to be, appears to be getting worse but nobody should vandalize those statues. Nobody should uh, tear them down. They should be removed from government land. Uh, they, the statues can go to, you know, could go to cemetery, Confederate cemeteries. I saw Confederate cemeteries when I was that summer in uh, 1954, 53, something like that. God, I'm old. Um, so the statues, in my opinion, should come down. I think we, uh, unfortunately, a mistake was made because there's so much hatred, and it shouldn't be that at that point now. And it's getting appears to be getting worse. So to anybody out there, don't vandalize, uh, don't vandalize any uh, statues. I saw there was some vandalism done at the Lincoln Memorial. Small, a small area. I saw it on. I didn't read the entire article. Don't vandalize. And there's oh, a tremendous number. The the number of attacks against calls into Jewish community centers and, th and uh, temples, forget what they're, uh, synagogues, the, the number of uh, bomb threats and everything has gone skyrocketed. Don't do, don't do that. That's, um, Moving on to, well, it's a sort of the same, well, let me drag this over here. Somebody asked me, I, I said the other day that it, for the first time in my life, I uh, reported a YouTube site, clicked on the thing, you can click on it to, you know, and that's a, uh, Patriot Nurse is somebody I said at the time I didn't want to mention the name because it would just have people going over there getting more traffic to her site and that uh, also people would go over and give thumbs up or people would give thumbs down to me or but that, anyway I, somebody asked so you know me so uh, this is the only site I've ever you know reported I think you can get an idea of uh, she, this video that she, that's when I saw, why I'm not sorry about Charlottesville. And I mean, she raves and rants and really uh, excessive and really out of control and, and going on about socialism, uh, you know, socialism, socialist, uh, you know, the Republicans ha have did a great job of taking socialism and making it a bad word and scaring people with it or whatever. Now, uh, communism and socialism are not the same. Sort of like, you know, <clears throat> is uh, Catholicism and uh, being a Baptist or whatever, 
are they the same? Well, they're both Christians. But, you know, they're not the same. Although I, one of those wouldn't be evil. But they, they, anyway, the Republicans were successful. They've been really good at that. Uh, well, they took communism and made it, people were afraid there was a communist and people would check their beds at night before they went to, to see if there was a communist underneath and they used that as a tool very well to, uh, they did blacklisting, you know, uh, all types, if you're not familiar with blacklisting, and don't want it, we don't have all time to go into it or whatever, but um, real quickly, when 1917, when Russia uh, went to communism, the entire world was uh, frightened and especially, you know, monarchs, places where there was, you know, a king or a queen or something like that. But all governments were because they were, you know, of the nature of communism. And so there was, then years later in the United States, well, then we have World War II. Well, we have some people in the United States before World War II who were, you know, communists. They believed and they were mistaken because they didn't know the real nature. They were going by the word, you know, uh, you know, bread for all and uh, all these type of things that sound good. Uh, so some people were, you know, a few people were members of the Communist Party. The Communist Party of the United States was never very big. I think probably half of the people in the Communist Party were FBI agents or FBI informers or whatever. It's, it's unbelievable, too, that during the Depression, the American people uh, didn't turn to communism. Uh, you would have thought that they would with the situation so bad that they would go for the thing. They really, really didn't. That's a good thing about the United States, that uh, we recognized the good things in our, we knew the system wasn't working as well as it should be, but so then the World War II comes and the USSR is our ally and we would not have won the, you know, without the Soviet Union doing the heavy lifting really. Uh, in World War II, we wouldn't have won World War II. And so the United States, they became, the USSR became our ally we, there were videos put out by the government uh, encouraging people to, you know, there was uh, to do what they could. We sent them, we sent Russia, we sent the USSR military equipment, tanks. We had tons of our shipping, you know, ships that were taking supplies to not just to the UK, but taking them to Russia. There, tons of our ships were torpedoed and sank trying to get supplies to the USSR. Then World War II comes to an end, and shortly after that, the Republicans then uh, accuse everybody in the United States, even President Truman, and military and the Department of State and everybody of being communists, filled with communists, and there's, there's hearings and anybody who had done anything during World War II to aid or speak up for the, you know, USSR, uh, entertainers get blacklisted, their careers are, you know, writers were blacklisted, companies wouldn't, uh, wouldn't hire them because the right-wing Republicans would, you know. So you have all of this, but how did I get on this subject? Had something to do. Oh, anyway, she's attacking. Oh, anyway, the so the Republicans were successful in taking. You know, they made communism the boogeyman, but they they also worked on socialism. They made it where uh, they were equal. You know, communism and socialism. Communism and socialism is not something that 
really fits in with our system of government, with our history, with our traditions. It doesn't really fit in uh, well. But the Republicans have attacked, have made socialism just as bad as to uninformed people. It's like, you know, Satanism, uh, communism, socialism. Oh my God. Europe has a lot of socialist countries and they are, when there's surveys of how happy the people are, the, the countries that are uh, socialist, they rank at the top. We don't rank when it comes to amount of uh, freedom. Uh, you know, we rank way down. The socialist countries rank it. Healthcare, top ones are so, you know, you know, we're talking Finland, Sweden, uh, Denmark, uh, and so on. So, but anyway, the Republicans managed to, and then the Republicans even got where they made liberal. Then they worked, started working on liberal. And they did really well at making liberal a bad word, where now you, you have Democrats who don't want to say, oh, I'm a liberal. They'll, they'll say, well, I'm a progressive. And, of course, now the Republicans are in such sorry shape they can't do the damage they would have done or they'd be working on the word progressive before long the poor Democrats wouldn't know what to call themselves. So anyway, this uh, lady here, the Patriot nurse, uh, raised in, in this uh, thing really viciously and sort of crazily. Uh, but uh, so anyway, that's the only site I've ever reported. Uh, I'm always open to everybody's point of view and uh, but I think she really went too far in this but uh, this guy by she uh, she she's an RN so I watched several of her I watched several of her videos before I flagged her which apparently hasn't done any good this this video is the one I flagged no, not this one on vaccine. The other one I was telling you about. Not that one. Let's close that. That one. But uh, she's also opposed to vaccine. That puts us all at danger by, you know, puts our children at, you know, at danger. Puts other children at, at danger. If, if you don't believe in getting your children vaccinated, you know, they're endangering other other children. But anyway, that's that's a very. I think I'm not sure what the divide is on that. There's, I think anybody who has a child that has some type of problem like mental retardation or something like that, I think they want to blame maybe that a vaccine did it. That it that God just didn't do it on his own or that, uh, so anyway, she's, uh, of course, one of the things I'm not sure, I think it was, might've been in this, nope, I'm going to close him out. I'll, he complained about, uh, she teaches courses too, goes around and I think they're like $550 or something like that. She teaches uh, survivalist and right-wing people who want to be prepared when Armageddon happens and when, you know, the government attacks us or the, the, our government collapse and, and how you can uh, be prepared to treat yourself and your family or whatever. And I, I have nothing wrong with, you know, I was, I was a civil defense volunteer. I was in the ground observer corps when I was a, all these things when I was a kid, trained by the state of Missouri to be a radio, radiological monitor. When the bombs hit, I would go out and with the Geiger counter and 
find out what areas were hot and dangerous and uh, uh, back about that time or whatever there was a, a book the ship's medicine chest and it, it's still out by the way but uh, it was uh, designed for uh, merchant marine service for somebody who was on a ship and if you had somebody that had a crew member that had appendicitis or broken arm or broken leg or no matter what it was this book um, told you what to do how to operate uh, how to do everything because there wasn't uh, there was you had to do it on the ship because uh, they don't have you know on a cruise ship they may have, you know, on a passenger cruise ship, they may have a doctor, probably do have a doctor. But if you're on a tanker or a freighter or whatever kind of a ship, nobody is available except uh, one of the ship's officers. A lot of times I think the radio officer. Um, so they had the book, The Ship's Medicine Chest. So I bought the book, loved the book, don't know what happened to it. And... Uh, just a few years ago, I thought it would be good to have. I, I wanted, I didn't get, haven't accomplished it yet. I wanted to get a, a box and put everything in there that uh, would be good to, you know, good to have in case, in case something happens. And I wanted that book in there. And I went and bought, a, you know, a brand new uh, edition of it. <laughs> and now it, you know, talks a little bit about like first aid or whatever. And then it just says um, there's no more talk about doing surgery or anything else. Uh, it just says uh, notify the Coast Guard and a helicopter will be sent to remove the uh, crew member who has had whatever the problem is. <laughs> the book is sort of. But anyway, she goes around and charges a lot of money and teaches um, uh, the medical, you know, advice for preppers, uh, people who are concerned about the end of the world and the government is going to be attacking and the food supply is going to fail and uh, the sun is going to send out a, of course we'd all be dead, but it's going to send out a burst of radiation or something's going to happen and but what um, and I think it's in this video I don't know how she got all this into a nine minute video because uh, <laughs> I can't get anything into a short time frame but I <clears throat> I worked um, hospital security for over 30 years I uh, worked at numerous hospitals, even down in uh, Florida for one hospital. That was a horrible experience. It was one of those, uh, the only one I worked at that was uh, profit-making, uh, what do you call it, the HCA or whatever, the one that was found guilty by the federal government of major theft and cheating and the current, I believe it's the current governor of Florida was the CEO of uh, the company. When I went to work for them uh, down there, everybody was, I think it was one entire day, we were required by uh, court order or the government to spend one day telling the employees what you could not do, what was illegal, and what the proper procedures were for reporting to the federal government when somebody was violating the uh, law. And, uh, but, so anyway, I've worked over 30 years hospital security. And uh, she mentioned in, I think that video, maybe it was another video, that uh, she carries a gun all the time that she's always armed, and if she goes to some 
uh, shopping mall or any place and there's a sign that says firearms not allowed. She pays no attention to it, not going to pay any attention to it. Uh, she says she works as an RN and in places where you're not supposed to be carrying a firearm, she carries a firearm anywhere into the work environment with her, that she's always armed. And uh, she says, oh, the worst they can do is kick me, you know, kick me out. Um, so that doesn't, you know, that didn't, that didn't win any uh, favors with me. Um, so I guess that was, that. I wanted to talk about something, something else. Oh, I know, this is, here it is, yeah. Already, uh, the right wing and the conspiracy theorist, uh, I haven't checked Alex Jones' site or whatever, but they're already saying that uh, Charlottesville was a staged event, not real, didn't really happen. Uh, of course, they'll probably say, yes, uh, uh, the blacks and the leftist, uh, socialist, uh, communist, uh, satanist, uh, child molesters on the left, that they attacked these poor innocent uh, KKK members, or also saying that it totally was all stage and everybody there was an actor playing a part, you know, and look, they've got 7,000 subscribers, this, and uh, I just watched, as you can see, just watched three minutes of this uh, video, so I don't know the entire thing, but they, I'm not sure if that's a real place that they're, over, if that's a, I think it's a real, but, uh, but one way you can tell that something like this is a bunch of crap is when you do a search for uh, LaRouche Pack or LaRouche or whatever, uh, when you do a search and the Google search you have like say five or six pages and the only thing you'll find is their site listed or another site they have set up that is listed and they're all listed and you won't find uh, I wonder if I went to Wikipedia and listed just, because it wasn't LaRouche. No, okay, that, I didn't want to, uh, was it? Uh, let's see. His name here, let's see, copy. Go to Wikipedia. I think. Wikipedia, let's see. See if we can pull up something with, I think, looks like it's in a foreign language, you know. It, wasn't he from Louisiana and a Klan member or something or other? Let's see. Okay, yeah, Lyndon LaRousse, American political figure, not the Canadian hockey player. That's what I was thinking. I think. American political activist, founder of the LaRouche movement, a writer on economic, scientific, political. Okay, was a presidential candidate in each election, oh no, 1976 to running for his own U.S. Labor Party. Okay, no, that's not, uh, I was thinking I was thinking he was, I was thinking of, uh, well, I don't think he's got a very good, uh, but that's not, I was thinking he was a clan member who, what's the guy that, I can't think of his name, I know that's a different guy, but I thought they were in the same. 
well, criminal investigations, I guess that's not... Uh, In October of 86, hundreds of state and federal officers raided his office in Virginia and Massachusetts. A federal grand jury indicted him and 12 of his associates on credit card fraud and obstruction of justice. The charges stated that he had attempted to defraud millions of dollars, including several elderly people, by borrowing money they did not intend to repay. Uh, let's see, on December, he was convicted of conspiracy to commit mail fraud involving more than 30 million, et cetera, et cetera. Thirteen associates were sentenced to prison terms ranging from one month to 77 years. Uh, he called... The trial judge, let's see, no, that's, uh, anyway, imprisonment, release on parole, visit to Russia, anyway. It's just really unbelievable that when these horrific tragedies happen that uh, these right-wing fanatic people will claim that it's a, a black operation, that it's a fake, actors were used, and nobody was killed, and they come up with the like they came up with uh, the military operation that takes place once a year or every couple of years in the United States. And this year or last year, it took place in Texas. And they claimed that it was uh, training for when the federal government, you know, arrest all the right-wing church-going people. And the story was that they were uh, going to be housed in Walmart. Clo the Walmart was closing stores so they could be turned into prisons. And that the basements were filled and there was tunnels leading from, uh, you know, the Walmart stores to the other underground tunnels <laughs> crisscrossing the United States, linking these Walmart stores together so people could be moved through the tunnel system and just. And there were people, I saw videos on YouTube of people sitting outside Walmart stores 24 hours a day uh, making videos of, okay, that's suspicious. That big semi-trailer truck just pulled into the Walmart, you know, Walmart stores. People went out to the railroad tracks all across the United States and uh, were videoing uh, trains as they go through and of course some trains will have military equipment on being moved from where they were manufactured to a base or uh, being moved someplace to be shipped out to other countries or whatever and that was that became oh I just saw a train it passed here you know and it had 12 flat cars they had tanks on them and they're getting ready to strike it's just a matter of minutes or hours and just on and on and on by the way, I've been watching, again, some of these videos on YouTube of uh, trains. Americans love, I think maybe everybody loves trains. Americans love trains. I love trains. I used to, well, I, I built trains. Uh, built coal haulers, the old coal haulers would come into the plant where I worked and we would strip them down to the bare backbone and then everything else was uh, new was put onto it, you know, then. 
I even worked a few days on a, a caboose, which I really wasn't comfortable doing because the training I had in welding was on heavy, you know, heavy plates. And when everybody was drunk at the plant that I worked at, they'd have to pull us all together. And we got paid every two weeks and three-fourths of the guys would uh, pick up their paycheck and then wouldn't come in that night so they'd have to take the few of us that weren't drunk and put us together so I ended up uh, uh, working on a caboose a few times welding and it was very thin material inside and I was used to welding on you know very thick steel. Then one time I had to go out when we were short of people to the final stage where the rail car went up on a ramp that had been manufactured out. It was earth, but there were tracks on it. Went up there, so it was extra high up. And the guy I was working with, who worked there regular, uh, was, I forget what kind of an Indian he was, and he was American Indian. And he was up there walking on, around on the uh, side of the railing of the coal hall, you know. And uh, he'd say, okay, this needs a tack weld over here, or this needs a weld over here. And I'd be crawling, you know, inching along, and he'd say, just stand up and walk over here, or whatever. And I just kept crawling on over there. I'd worked, though, at a Texaco refinery in Convent, Louisiana, on, uh, and I had to climb up then for, uh, well, you've seen those refineries with the tall cooling towers or whatever they are that go way up there, and that was back before OSHA, so there wasn't any cage, there wasn't any safety rope as you went up the, once you got up there, if you were at the edge, you put on hook up thing, but so far as crawling up, there wasn't any cage around you, and there wasn't any cable, any thing on your belt that you kept hooking up as you went up. You just had pieces of steel that somebody like myself or myself had welded that were steps to go up. But just walking along the, so I was glad I only had to go there one time at that, at the Darby Corporation in Kansas City, Kansas. I mean, I went there, worked there, I mean, on this one day that I had to go and do the finishing touches on this rail car before it went out. And how did I get on that subject? Oh, well, I was going to say, uh, oh, yeah, a lot of people love and been watching some of the videos and the railroad police or other police are... There's fans who like to go out there and record these trains. I wish I'd have done it back when the steam, in, you know, or back uh, in the olden days. But back before, you know, the World Wide Web began in 1995, uh, starting back in like, like around 1982 when I had my bulletin board system before the World Wide Web. I pulled in news groups, and that was one of the news groups that I pulled in uh, for people in the Kansas City area or anybody who wanted to dial into my BBS over the phone line. And I pulled in a news group of people who discussed, you know, railroads and railroad engines. And uh, there are people who will know that, especially an old engine, but not just an, but will know that an old engine is going to be going down the tracks through. Uh, Sugar Creek, Missouri, or the Union Station, or something rather, and people show up and take video and photos of it. And you can see those on the uh, on YouTube. But uh, so I don't know why the railroad police would be. There are people who also, when they do that, that have a scanner and they can pick up the railroad communications and hear them and they'll hear that uh, the engineer or somebody in the engineering department will be saying notify the police you know that 
there's somebody at such and such, you know, whatever. Now, of course, you cannot, well, you, you're not supposed to go on to the railroad right away, and you're not supposed to, the gravel that is next, you know, the gravel or whatever is next to it, which I don't know is eight feet on each side or 10 feet or 15 feet or whatever. You're not supposed to be on that. And that just makes sense. You know, you, the uh, trains hit a lot of people. They hit a lot of cars. If you're an engineer and you work, I don't know, X number of years or whatever, you are probably have, you know, going to be, you're going to have smashed, your train is going to have smashed into cars and killed people and uh, nothing you could do about it and that's uh, very you know very devastating to to somebody even though there was nothing you could do but that just makes sense too to be if if you're out there to see a train go by don't go stand right by the, you know right by the tracks because the trains coming down the engineer sees you there and he doesn't know whether you're going to dart out in front of his train or whether you want to commit suicide or whatever so stand back also don't go walking around with your cell phone you know uh, some of these times you know you have several sets of tracks and you'll be watching a train or even drivers will you know do that uh, they'll see the train coming and then the train goes by and then they step out or drive out onto the tracks and there's a train coming maybe the other direction on the track right next to it. Uh, so don't be walking around with your cell phone and paying attention, you know, pay attention. Anyway, that's, that's it for today. Thank you very much for watching.